Recently, I happened to see a request on Reddit from a user that wanted to get some help with a PCB design. I didn't see any responses yet, and I felt like I might be able to help, so I posted my comments. This person did a great job of taking comments from myself and others to modify their design and ended up with a much better board design. I figured this would make a good topic for a video, so I asked their permission, and they agreed to put it on my channel. I don't want to call anyone out by name here. Everyone makes mistakes, including me, and we all started from somewhere. I don't have my old board designs to show you, but I'm sure I made many of the same mistakes that I'm about to cover, and likely quite a few more. My goal here is to show you how I look at a board design today, especially with simpler boards. I'm going to avoid going into too much theory and just focus on the tips, techniques, and thought process I use for my boards. This is the board design that I initially took a look at. For anyone that's brand new to PCB design, the off-white letters and symbols are the ink on the top of the board, mostly used for identifying components. The red areas here represent the metal, usually copper, on the top of the board, and these blue lines are the metal on the bottom of the board. The yellowish circles and squares are through-hole component mounting points. In the center of each is a hole drilled through the board, and these provide an electrical connection from the top layer to the bottom layer of copper. There are also some vias on the board, very similar to the through-hole mounting points, but much smaller, and these are used only to provide a conductive path between the top of the board and the bottom of the board. First, I want to mention a few things that were done correctly that a beginner might miss. The connectors and headers are placed logically along the edge of the board. I'm not sure if this board is designed to interface with something specifically, or if the headers are just there for ease of use, but I like the placement. Devices are spaced out enough that they can be placed, routed, and soldered fairly easily. This design uses only through-hole components, which is a bit of a rarity these days. I can appreciate that though, especially when I was starting out. I found that through-hole components are far easier to work with. Everything appears to be connected correctly. I don't see any traces running into others that might produce an issue. There are a couple of spots where the traces come close to other features, but there's likely enough clearance. Most software for PCB design will make sure you don't short nets together, but I've never used KiCad for a board design myself, so I'm not entirely sure if it has those types of safeguards. Component labels are clear, and where polarity is important, it is identified. For example, on the large electrolytic capacitors and on these diodes. That helps a lot when assembling the board. It can be a month or two between ordering a board and getting it back, and it's easy to forget in that time which way a capacitor or diode was supposed to go in a design if you don't have it marked. Signal traces never make 90 degree corners. This helps with signal integrity, especially when you get into higher frequency signals. Power traces are larger than signal traces. It's not a necessity, but I like to make my power traces larger for a few reasons. First, it differentiates them when I look at the design. I know exactly what traces are carrying my power around the board at a glance. Second, it reduces resistance, which helps ensure the power is delivered to the device and not burned off as heat. Third, inductance is reduced and capacitance is increased on the trace, both of which are good things for power. Lower inductance means instantaneous current changes are faster, and higher capacitance means there's more charge available locally for devices to use. So that's everything I thought of that was well done. Let me know if you think I missed something in the comments. Now let's look at what I think needs to be fixed. One thing that isn't critical but is worth bringing up is that traces should never make acute angles on a PCB. For example, near RV1, two traces meet and they make this acute angle. With most modern board manufacturing houses, this won't cause a major issue, but it is possible for the liquid they use to etch away the copper to pull up in these corners and eat away more of the trace than is desirable. That's really all I'm going to cover from the left side of the board. It's mostly DC power components over there, so there's not as much concern on that side of the board when it comes to everything else I'm going to talk about. On the right side, we see a lot of traces run close together. Running traces together makes them look nice and is an easy way to get from one side of the board to the other without using much space. However, this can cause significant amounts of crosstalk between signal lines, especially with the lack of a ground plane here. For every signal that you send on the surface of your board, 
there needs to be a return path for ground back to the sending device. To be clear, there is technically a path on this board for return current. However, it is not very optimized and could result in noisy signals. Look at D10 for an example. The signal runs from the MCU to J4. But then how does the return current come back through the ground? The nearest ground is on the other side of either D9 or D11, and there's no direct path back to the MCU for ground. Any way it comes back, the field created between D11 and ground will intersect the neighboring traces of D9 and D11, which will cause them to pick up some of whatever signal is on D10. The best fix for this is to add a ground plane. I want to mention that there are large areas of ground fill here, and that is good. However, I would recommend a different approach. If I'm designing a two-layer board like this, I like to use the bottom side of the board for ground and not much else. Just to mention it, because I'm sure someone will bring it up, not every board needs a ground plane. You can build quite a few circuits without ever needing one. Anything that operates on extremely slow signals doesn't really need ground plane. For example, a battery, LED, switch, and resistor will work fine to light up an area without any need for a ground plane, just wires. So why do I think this board needs one? Well, the purpose of this board is to house a microcontroller, and that device will need to communicate through the traces on the board. I'd like to keep the signal integrity as good as possible, at least until those leave the board. One place I think a ground plane might make a large difference is with the crystal oscillator circuit. Here you can see that the crystal is placed close to the MCU, which is good, and how you should place it. The MCU is driving the crystal as part of a resonant circuit, including C6 and C5. These capacitors are part of that circuit, and they should definitely have a low impedance path to ground, specifically the ground pin of the MCU. Here we can see that the ground connection of C6 has to go all the way around the capacitors, crystal, and even through the ground pin of C5 to get back to the MCU ground. We can also see that the signal traces going to each pin of Y1 are running above other signal traces on the bottom of the board. In the current state, I'm not entirely sure if that crystal would correctly oscillate. Now let's take a look at the board after some revisions were made. This version is significantly better. Immediately, I can see that traces were spread out and a ground plane was filled on the bottom of the board. The crystal has a clear ground plane underneath it that provides an excellent low impedance path back to the device ground. I think if this design were built just the way it is, it would do fairly well. There are still a few small areas to make improvements though. The first thing that stands out to me is this large 5 volt trace on the bottom of the board that's basically chopping the ground plane in half. To see what I mean, let's follow D10 and look at the return path for ground current. From J4 there's a nice ground plane underneath the signal line, which is great, but then we get close to the device, the ground current will have to take a large detour over here. It may go around past the 5 volt connector, or it may go up through C10 and back down the ground pin of J6, but either way, it's definitely spreading out that signal over a larger area than we would like, and it's probably going to cause some crosstalk on D9 through D13. We see a similar issue up by switch 1, with a reset line cutting up the ground plane. The component can be moved a bit, and the trace can also be moved to the top side of the board. Also, looking at the bottom corner, we see that A0 to A5 all have a ground plane cut by the same signal. One other thing I noticed was that C1 and C2 were likely intended as bypass capacitors, but the ground return path for those is also fairly long. C2 has the biggest issue with a pretty long way to get back to ground for the device. Bypass capacitors are there to provide a low impedance source of charge for the device so you want to keep them as electrically close to the device as possible. Typically, this means first physically placing them close, like this person did, but also making sure that the supply and ground paths are short. Now let's look at the last version of the board. I like that the traces on the left were fattened up. I like to have a fairly beefy trace on the power supply side, as I mentioned earlier. The ground plane under all the signals is very cohesive, and the bypass capacitors now have much shorter paths to the ground pins of the MCU. 
I definitely think this board is now worlds better than what the person started with, and I think they're going to see a significant improvement in their final product. If you have any advice for people new to creating PCBs, please leave it down in the comments. Thanks for watching.